I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. In just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my stairs. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who cry. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my stairs. Because he lives, we live also. And not only just live, but have everlasting life. Isn't that a great thought? And we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Darlene, Mike just called, and Darlene is uh, sick, and so we ask that you be praying for her and continue to keep Becky Clements in your prayers. <clears throat> and my son Jim has missed work all week because of cluster headaches, and they still have not found out what's causing these. And even though we did have an MRI done, uh, there's not a uh, what do you, uh, tumor. There's not a tumor or anything like that, and uh, so forth. So you keep him uh, in prayer, if you will. And uh, then, Brother Coles, I believe you're going to have some surgery. Is that right, coming up? Yes, sir. Right, on Friday, I believe. Have I got the wrong name? <laughs> All right. Well, will you be praying for him for Friday for surgery? I might be having surgery, too, for help, but uh, anyway, uh, you, you pray for these dear friends. How many of you have an unspoken request? All right, a great number of you do. I certainly do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your presence with us, and we thank you for blessing us and using us for your glory and for your honor. And Father, I ask that you'll help us to stay in the center of your will. And Father, as we humble ourselves before you, and we look forward to what you're going to do for us and through us. And, Father, we know that when we allow you to come into our life, that you'll make a difference. And, Father, when we give ourselves to you totally and completely, then you can work in our life in a tremendous way. And we thank you for that. And, Father, I pray now that you will bless our congregation, bless our church, bless these that are ill. Lord, I pray that you'll have your good hand of blessing upon them and that you'll give healing and uh, that they'll be feeling uh, better, stronger, and will be able to be back about their work and back into the house of the Lord uh, again. And so, Father, I pray that you will just bless our church. pray that you'll bless this service tonight. And, Father, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted up. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, as he is lifted up, that men will be drawn to him. And uh, we know, Heavenly Father, that your word is true. And so I ask that you will help us to stay in the center of your will. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Be seated, if you will, please. After the service tonight, Brother Charles Parrish uh, is going to take uh, our new cruiser out for a little short jaunt. If some of you would like to get in it and look at it and take a little ride and see how uh, the thing handles and so forth, you can do so. And so right after the service tonight, if you'd like to do that, Brother Parrish will go out and he'll start it up and... Um, Obviously, we only take about 43 at a time, unless everybody wants to go. But anyway, we'll take as many as we can. If you'd like to take a little ride on it just to see uh, how it rides and get it set, get set. So uh, that'll be for you uh, tonight after the service. Then <clears throat> Wednesday evening, our prayer meeting, Thursday night, our visitation. Let me remind our staff and our deacons, Sunday school superintendents, teachers, everyone, we need to be here faithfully for our uh, visitation. 
and uh, go out after those that uh, are out into the community. And so let me remind you of that. We've had such a good turnout uh, for visitation on the last few weeks, and we thank the Lord for that. And then if you could help with the bus ministry on Saturday morning, well, we'd appreciate that also. Next Sunday night, after the service, I want to meet with the Grounds and Building Committee. <clears throat> and we'll meet in Brother Charlie's class, and we hope we won't keep you a long time. But uh, there's some things that we need to look at, and uh, we need to keep our building as uh, nice as it can be. There may be a time we need a, uh, a work day and so forth, and so we'll meet Building and Grounds Committee. Now, that'll be next Sunday evening after the services. Now, let me say something to you tonight. Here is our financial statement for August. Now, that catches up our financial statements. There was a time that we were, we were behind, and the reason for that was is because Brother Powell, who puts these out, Darlene didn't know whether she was going to live or die. And he was taking her to the hospital, taking her, just going here and there. On top of that, uh, this, remember the situation we had with the bank uh, because the IRS was sticking their nose into what was going on. The IRS said that I owed them $5,000. And uh, because uh, my taxes are so technical, uh, part of, uh, of my uh, income uh, paid out to one part of the government, one to another part. Uh, there's a explicit idea on housing and so forth, and they got all that messed up. Well, the IRS went into the bank, our bank, and started checking all of that out, and there were some problems there. <clears throat> so Mike had to deal with that and all of the other things that he had to deal with. Plus, on top of that, his back was hurting, and then after that, the computer went down. And so it just seemed like it was one thing after another. And so we have, uh, we're, we're called up now. But can I say this lovingly and charitably? If you have a question about this, come to my office or come to Mike's office. Out in the vestibule, down the hall, in the Sunday school, that's not the place to discuss this. We ought to be in unity and oneness. We're one church. And if you have a question, we'll answer it. If I can't answer it, Brother Powell uh, will answer it. And uh, so if you have a question, come to us and uh, we'll do our very, very best to answer it. There's nothing to hide, nothing to hide. When I came here as pastor uh, 11 years ago, the church was $465,000 in debt. Uh, the budget was $3,200 a week and we were averaging $1,500. We're now debt free and the Lord has done some great things for us. We've made a lot of improvements. We were able to buy a bus. We're gonna be able to pay for that as long as we're faithful and pay our tithes and that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, I don't think I'm out to cheat the church or do anything underhanded. I don't think that at all. I think everything's as above board as can be. And so if you do have a problem, uh, come and see me and come and see Mike. And the church voted on some things that we can do and we're gonna do them. And uh, if you've got a problem with us, discuss that. If you have a problem with my missions trip that the church voted to send me on every year, if you've got a problem with that, we'll discuss that. And we have nothing to hide. Nothing at all. And the uh, financial statement is right there. It's for you to see, and I'm glad for that. But if you have a question, see Brother Powell, see me, and we'll answer it for you. And then if we have to answer anything publicly, we'll answer it publicly. And I just feel like I need to say that. Uh, I know that some were a little upset because we didn't have the report out every month the way it should be, and I will admit that it should have been out there, but I just sort of felt that I wasn't gonna put pressure on a man who didn't know whether his wife was gonna live or die, taking her to the hospital and all of that. And so if you wanna hold me guilty of that, I'm guilty. But I just didn't feel like I wanted to put that kind of pressure. But I felt like you had enough confidence in this preacher and Brother Powell uh, that we would handle it that way. And after 12 years, if you don't have that confidence in me, then you need another preacher. And uh, I'd be glad to, to do whatever needs to be done. But I just felt like I needed to clear the air and say that. So if you have a question about this, come see me or come see Brother Powell, and uh, we'll be happy to answer that for you. And by the way, you keep, up, keep on giving the way you are, and we'll have that bus paid off pretty soon, and uh, then we'll go driving down the road, and it'll be paid for. Amen? And uh, Brother Wayne is, uh, you're not Brother Wayne, uh, Brother Wayne is getting ready some trips now for our seniors, and uh, the teens are getting ready to go, and so we have some good things ahead of us, and we're looking forward to it. And so just keep right down in the center of the road 
and let's keep our unity that we've always had. I don't know about you, but I think it was a glad day when we got Brother Wayne to come as our music director. There's been so many good things happened, and Brother Wayne is so talented in so many areas. And uh, I'll guarantee you one thing. The only trouble I have with him is slowing him down. Wayne, go home. Rest up. But I'm enjoying myself. And I'll tell you, he's worth far more than we're paying him. I'll tell you that right now. And a good, uh, a good man. I have a picture. A picture of just Dawn. Now, this picture, by the way, that's Dawn. That, that's Dawn. The other's a catfish. Now, she said she caught this. She said she caught this thing. My question is this. What fish shop did she go to to buy it and then have her picture taken with it? But she said she caught that thing, and she's holding it up. And so she wanted all of the men, Charlie, and uh, over here, and Dale, she wants you men to see that and wants to know if you guys can top it. Well, uh, I don't know. We'll just have to see. But that's just Dawn. I've got that here if you want to see it. If you're visiting with us tonight or for the first time or the first time in a long time, we're glad you're here. We'd like to get into your hand a visitor's card, ask you to fill it out and drop it in the offering in a few moments. And if you're a guest, just remain seated. All of our members stand. All of our members standing and our guests, if you'll just remain seated. And uh, we'll shake hands with one another here in just a few moments, and we'll have our offering. Brother Wayne, you come and lead. Amen. 375, what a joy in my heart since Jesus came in. 375. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrong since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul. Jesus. 
together. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy are my soul. Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Lots of joy on my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. You may be seated. Right. We come to the time in our service where we read our missionary letters. Our first letter tonight from the Leonard family serving the Lord in Jamaica. It says, Dear friends, thank you for your help to reach the people of Jamaica. I'm glad to report to you that we have distributed about 89,500 Gospels of John and Romans so far this year. I've seen many people reading the scriptures several days after I've worked in the area. We have had a request by the chaplain of prisons here in Jamaica for 20,000 copies for the prisoners. I have already given out some in the local jails. This is another open door for the Gospel. Pray that some of the criminals will be saved because of this effort. Some of you have been concerned for us during these troubled times in Jamaica. It has been reported that as many as 45 people have been killed in widespread political violence here in Jamaica. In our area, only a few riots and roadblocks have been staged. However, during one of these roadblocks, a policeman was killed when he was stoned by the crowd as he was trying to remove some debris out of the road. Pray for the peace of Jamaica. Our work with the Chinese community continues to grow. We are now having regular services with them each Sunday, and the Lord has given us a little space in the building in the center of town. We are planning to use this small room for an office and an outreach center. We have also moved our English classes to the room. Pray for us as we work to reach all the people of Jamaica with the gospel, whatever it takes, Tim Leonard. And our second letter tonight comes from the Waits, missionaries to Slovakia. It says, Dear Praying Friends, it has been three months since we arrived in Slovakia, Somehow the time has just disappeared. God has been good. The last three months have been a time of tremendous blessing for us. It would take too long to give a lot of the details, so in this letter we're just going to highlight some of the things God has done for us during the first three months in Slovakia. He's provided us with a very nice two-bedroom apartment with a spectacular view of the mountains. We have a very good landlord whose family has been tremendously helpful. We were able to start formal language study immediately rather than waiting until September. We have a very good teacher who has a degree in the Slovak, teaching Slovak to foreigners. We have already completed the first semester of classes and are seeing daily progress in the language. We have also found an excellent tutor that we are working with two days a week in the afternoon. The paperwork for our, prep, our resident permits was completed within a month of our arrival here in the country. The two crates we shipped from the states arrived on July 9th with no damage to anything inside. Customs paperwork was completed within a week and we did not have to pay anything. Two weeks ago, we were able to purchase a 1994 VW Passat station wagon that is in excellent condition. We were able to purchase the car without assuming any debt. David is settling down, enjoying his new home. He is learning the language and making friends. The church people have welcomed us with open arms. It has been such a blessing to get to know them better. Our arrival here coincided, coincided with some health concerns for our coworker, John Goward. We were able to cover the church ministries for several weeks while he recovered. 
Don's eyes have improved quite a bit in the last three months. He has had several bouts with infection, but not nearly as often as before. Leanne has had no symptoms with her heart at all, for the longest period of time in almost three years. And our support level is up to 99%. We will begin the second semester of language school the first week of September. Children's and youth ministries at the church will also be resumed after summer holidays at that time. We will be taking an active role in these ministries beginning in September. Please pray that God will use our limited ability in the language to communicate with people and that his will be a good opportunity for enriching our language learning experience. Thank you so much for your prayers. We specifically requested that you pray for us as we study the language. We know that without your prayers, this difficult task would be so much harder. We have felt your prayers during the last three months. We are encouraged by the progress we see. There's still a long ways to go. Please do keep our study of the Slovak language before the Lord in your prayers. Please pray for our coworkers, John and Lydia Gouge. John has some health needs and they're being treated, but that are a concern to them. In his service, Don, Leanne, and David White. Just two of the missionaries that we support and just thinking about the Leonard's in Jamaica and the unrest that's there, I mean, if you've been reading the paper, you can see that what's going on in Afghanistan and other countries like that where people are told they can't preach the gospel, they face some prison sentences, you know, they can either be stoned or, or killed. And our missionaries have to deal with this every single day, so we need to keep them in our prayers. Join me now in prayers. We pray for the Leonard's, we pray for the Waits, and for the ministries around the world. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. We can come and we can pray and we can just lift up our missionaries. Lord, we're thankful for people, men, women, boys and girls, that these families that just willingly go and wherever you might send them, Lord, whatever country it might be, that's just to give their lives over to you completely for one reason, that's to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And share the love of, that you have for them, Lord, that even though that they're sinners, that you want to see them saved. We pray for the Leonard's and the work in Jamaica that you continue to work there. We're thankful for the tracks that have been passed out, and we pray that we'd see fruit from that, Lord. We pray for the prisoners as they start to receive the, the gospel tracks there, that you would just open up their hearts and be, help them to be receptive and help them to see that, Lord, even though they may be in a prison, there's a greater prison they face here in this world, and the one thing that can free them from that prison is Jesus Christ. We pray for the unrest that they're facing, Lord. You give them peace, that you bring uh, safety to our missionaries there and around the world as well, Lord. We pray for the way as they continue to study the Slovak language, that you would help them, that they could uh, use this time as they start in the children's ministry there, Lord, to just improve their language skills and to further their work there, that they could reach people clearly with the gospel of Jesus. We thank you so much for our church here and giving us the opportunity to give to missions, and we're thankful for a missions-minded church, and help us to be faithful to that which you've called us here as well. And we pray for our missionaries around the world tonight as they're going through their services, that you bless there, and that we continue to see souls saved, for that's what it's all about, Lord, seeing the kingdom of heaven enriched. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Hymn number 744, to back your book, there's a little chorus. Stand together and sing, he's able, he's able, I know he's able. He's able. to come forward at this time as we prepare to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask Brother John Cross, if he would, to come and lead us in prayer tonight. He's going to pray for our offering. He's also going to lift up the names of those in our priceless chest. Inside that chest is names of people and slips of paper that represent souls. And we want to see those souls saved, and so we pray for them each and every service. Now, you pray along with Brother John as he prays and ask the Lord to bless our offering and also for those in the priceless chest. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a good day in your house. Father, we thank you so much for 
meeting our needs today, for all your blessings upon us. Thank you for Gospel Light Baptist Church and for what it stands for, for this community and around the world. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless this offering tonight, that you would uh, use it to further your kingdom. Lord, that you would multiply it and, and help us to uh, spend it wisely. Lord, give us the wisdom to uh, do what we need to do with this money. Father, we ask you to save these souls that we have placed in this priceless chest. And God, uh, just someone there close to them that could witness to them. And Lord, if it would be one of us, uh, whatever it would take, Father, we just ask that you would uh, meet the need, the spiritual need of each one of these in the box. And Lord, uh, they will be saved before it's eternally too late. Bless this service tonight in Christ's name. Amen. the Lord touch you all. I know heaven is real, but is the fish real? Ah, that's the question. All right, turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Tonight I want to speak to you on the subject essentials for the home. We've been talking about the home and marriage for several weeks, and this will be the concluding message in that series. And out of Matthew chapter 12, may seem to you like a little strange passage for this subject, but I think you'll see uh, what we're uh, going
going for here in the passage as it unfolds. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch as that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all of the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doeth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then this kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Look at verse 29. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Bow with me in prayer, if you will, and let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, this is an important subject we are embarking on tonight. And there are some essentials, biblical essentials, that every home must apply and live by if we're going to be a success and have a strong home. And our nation has so many homes that are weak and divided. And Father, especially Christians who need to have a united home and a united front. And so Father, I ask that you will help us as husbands and wives and young people to do everything that we can to see to it that we have a strong home and that we observe the essentials that's laid down in scriptures that make for a happy and joyous and spiritual a uh, home that has a spiritual stronghold where Satan is unable to enter and defeat. And so, Father, if there are some here tonight who might be struggling and Satan may really uh, be zeroing in upon their home, then we pray tonight that this passage of Scripture might be of a tremendous help uh, to each one. And so, Father, I ask that you will help us tonight. This prayer I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 600 couples from all over the United States were asked this question. Do you love your spouse? Now think with me. 600 couples were asked this question. Do you love your spouse? Only 11% answered yes. Only 11% answered yes. One man said the greatest challenge facing man today is staying married. One of the greatest challenges facing man today is staying married. One man said this, there is something terribly wrong with the institute of marriage today. Now that's a strong statement, and I'm not sure I agree with it, but I think that I can say this, the devil hates the institute of marriage. He hates it. Why? Because it was conceived in the mind of God. And marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's plan. It was God who decided that he would create man, that he would create them male and female. They would be different, but they would be one. They then would come together in the bonds of holy matrimony. God would give to them children. And that structure... That strong family structure, a strong home, a strong spiritual family structure would see that the nation was strong and through that family structure people would be saved and God's name would be glorified. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this, a man is blessed who has a lot of children. Blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them. And the idea is this, just like an arrow is a tremendous weapon in battle, Children can become a tremendous weapon 
in spiritual battles. Obviously, we're not doing a good job of that in the United States today. In days gone by, they did a much better job. You think of Susanna Wesley and uh, great preachers and their wives who raised godly children. And uh, from the Wesley Union came 11 preachers and statesmen. They raised godly men and godly children that made a difference in their society and made a difference in, the wor in their world. Now, where is that happening today? And why is that not taking place uh, today? Now, I think I have some answers to that, but it's not my goal tonight to answer that in this message. But to simply say to you tonight, it is essential for this country, it is essential for the world that we have strong homes. It is essential for this church that we have strong homes. Let me say that again. It is essential for this church to have strong homes. These teenagers growing up, these singles that come in on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, they need to not only be able to look at their mother and dad and say, my mother and dad mirrors a Christ-like relationship. My father is what a man ought to be. He's what a father ought to be. I learn about fatherhood from my dad. My mother is a picture of what a godly woman is. And uh, as I observe her, I know what it is to see a godly woman. And as I see my mother and dad live together, they are a picture of godlyhood. And they are a picture of a godly home. Our young people need to see that because they learn by watching and observing and seeing and feeling. You see, a couple can say one thing, but if they do not practice it in reality, the children are going to pick up on what's real rather than what is conceived to be real by the parents, by the mom and by the dad. Children feel and sense a lot more than we know and a lot more than we think. And mom and dad may give the outward idea that everything is all right, everyone, everything is fine, but yet those children can sense and see that something's wrong. And that'll cause problems, and that'll cause rifts uh, in the home. Children need to see a strong home. They need to see a strong unity between mom and dad. Now, the passage that we've just read tonight, Jesus has healed or has cast out devils. Jesus healed and cast out devils because he was the Messiah. The Old Testament said that when the Messiah comes from God, that the uh, deaf would, and dumb would be healed and that miracles would be performed. And this is how you will know this is God's Messiah. So Jesus came performing miracles. The Pharisees said, while well, these miracles he performs are performed through the devil. Now that's the unpardonable sin in the Gospels. That's the unpardonable sin while Jesus was walking here on the earth, attributing his miracles to the devil. And Jesus said, if you do that, you can't be saved in this life nor in the life to come. And that's the background of this whole situation here. But yet Jesus went on to say, well, if that is true, then Satan is divided and he's fighting against himself. And if he fights within himself, then he will not be able to stand. And so the idea here is this. There must be unity if a home is going to stand. There must be unity if a nation is going to stand. There must be unity if a church is going to stand. One of Satan's greatest ploys and one of Satan's greatest goals is to bring disunity. Now the devil will come always from the outside with persecution. But he finds that most of the time, not always, but he finds most of the time that when he persecutes God's people, they just get better and stronger because that drives them to the Lord. So then he comes with his next plan, and that is to come from within and to divide. Satan is a divider. Jesus is a complementer. He is a man who builds unity, uh, and the devil is a divider. And so here comes the devil to a church. And what does he want to do? He wants to divide. There's a new word, oratory. You ever heard it? You know what it means? It means the rule of the few. That's what it means, the rule of the few. Now, 
Now, we're a congregational form of church government. By that, we mean the congregation has a say in what goes on. We vote as a congregation. We move as a congregation. But I'll tell you this, if I ever go to another church, if God ever calls me to another church, the first question I'll ask the deacon board, the first question that I'll ask the pulpit committee is, do you have an oratory in this church? Is this church ruled by the few? And if it is, I don't have any part to do of it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, it's His church. And He runs the church through His people. And the church should not be run by the few. It should be Jesus the head, and the pastor and the church working together. But you see, Satan wants to get in and to divide that. And if he can divide that, then the church will not have any power. And the church will lose sight on what it's doing. Let me say this. We want to be very careful here in our church. We need to be very careful and not get caught up into having so much thought and power and energy into the inward working of the church and forget that God has placed us here to reach this community for the glory of God. A church that concentrates fully on the, in its inner workings is eventually going to die. You have to have a focus on the outside. You have to have a focus on ministries, helping people, getting people saved or, uh, in the community and around the world. Now the same thing is true with the home. If Satan cannot destroy the home from the outside through persecution, then he'll try to get on the inside of the home and divide. He'll try to place a division between the husband and the wife. He may use the children. He may use finances. Uh, there's a myriad of things that the devil will use to get into the home to divide it because obviously there is no strength unless there's unity. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Now look at verse 29 again. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? I use that verse to try to say to you tonight, don't let Satan come into your home and move you away from your strength. Don't let Satan come into your home and divide. Stay unified in the home. Now, there are three words in our text tonight that I want you to see. In verse 25, notice the word divided. As a matter of fact, Jesus uses this word several times. But look at verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And the word divided here means a difference between. A difference between or differ. Now that's what Satan wants to do. He wants there to be a division in the home. He wants to divide the home so there's a difference between the husband and the wife or whatever so that he can get a foothold and he can ruin that home and that home loses its power. Now then, in order to keep a home divided, a home must be biblical. You must agree that this is your guidebook. Now, 17 magazines not going to get it done for you. And uh, the New York Times is not going to get it done for you. Uh, you can't uh, follow that. And by the way, Oprah is not going to be able to help you much there either. And, uh, and some of the others... Uh, Emma Bumbeck and some of the others, although I did like one thing Emma Bumbeck said. She said, why don't someone notice Madonna so she can get on with her life? <laughs> and, I, and I agree with that. Uh, but that's not going to help you. This is what's going to help you here. You, and you've got to come to this book and understand that God has principles laid down for a strong home. And you've got to follow those principles or there will be a division in your home. Uh, yes, uh, we are to submit ourselves one to another. And yes, we are to understand that the husband is to love the wife. The wife is to be under submission to the husband. That the children uh, honor and recognize and, and love their parents. All of that has to be, or there's going to be a, a, a difference, a division, and there's going to be problems. So we do not want our home to be divided. But look at verse 25 and notice another word. Not only the word uh, divided, but look at the word desolation. 
Again in verse 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself, watch it now, is brought to desolation. The word desolation there means to lay waste. To lay waste. Here's what the devil would love to do with your home. The devil would love to get into your home and divide it. The husband go in one direction, the wife go in another direction. The children are separated, half with a husband, half with a wife, or one with a wife, one with a husband. And here's a family rifted apart, ripped apart. And sometimes we are so, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I hope I'm not to, uh, coming to the point where you feel that maybe I'm trying to hurt you. I'm not, but I must say this. Put yourself in a little six- or seven-year-old boy's position. Put yourself in a little six- or seven-year-old girl's position. She's used to her home. He's used to his home. He's used to his bedroom. She's used to a routine. She's used to mommy and daddy. And all of a sudden, daddy's going to leave. Mama's going to leave. And that little boy or that little girl is going to be swan asunder. She loves her daddy. She loves her mother. But I've got to go live with mama, but I love daddy. I've got to live with daddy, but I love mommy. And that little boy goes to sleep at night knowing in a few more days he'll leave his home and leave his bedroom and have to go with mommy or have to go with dad. Why do I have to do that? And then down the road, another man comes in, another woman comes in, another marriage, more brothers, more sisters. Now, I understand this happens, and I'm not saying divorce if you're second-class citizens or second-class Christians. I'm just trying to get you to think to do what God has told us to do, stay together. So that a little boy or a little girl doesn't have to have their hearts broken to pieces. And so they don't have to make a decision, will I live with daddy or will I live with mom? Will I be uprooted from everything that I know and everything that I love? And will our home be laid waste? Go back to God's plan and follow it. And these things will not have to come to, to, to pass for our children. Divided, there's a difference between desolation. Homes are laid waste. And then look at verse 29. Notice the word spoil. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods? The word spoil there means to plunder. Plunder. The devil wants to plunder the home. Uh, I'm not real good at putting things together. I, if you tore a, a, an engine apart and told me to put it back together, uh, well, good luck, fella. If you tore a house up and told me to put it back together, good luck. I, I'm not good at that. Now, I can tear it up, but putting it back together, seems like when I put something back together, I've got four or five items left over. Where did this come from? You know, that kind of thing. I'm not your average handyman. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that, and it drives my wife crazy. I think I can change the light bulb in the house. I believe I can do that. And I think maybe I can change the filters. I can probably get that done. And, but anything else, we have to have it hired, done, or have it done uh, for us. Uh, so I, I guess I could be good at plundering when it comes to houses and cars and that kind of thing. But plundering's not good. And it's not good for the home. But that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to plunder your home and divide it. He wants to plunder this church. He wants to plunder nations. There's a word that's thrown around by psychologists today uh, concerning the home, and it's the word dysfunctional a dysfunctional home. And I know that's a modern term, but I know this. I know the devil wants to divide and to bring our homes to desolation, and I know that he wants to spoil the home. But oh, wait a minute. How can we avoid that? How can we keep a strong family unit and never come to the place where those kind of things have to happen? Let me suggest quickly tonight uh, three or four things that you know already, but I want you to think about them tonight. If we're going to have a strong home, there are some essentials. Number one, there must be uncompromised fidelity. Uncompromised fidelity. A husband and a wife must be true to one another. There must be a strict observance of promises and loyalty and faithfulness. 
a bride walks down the aisle and her fiancé is standing here and they meet together and a lady came in Friday to meet with me about a wedding they want to have in January and one of our fine young couples is getting ready to, to get married and they'll walk down the aisle, God willing, and they will stand here and they will make promises before God and make promises to God and make promises to one another. Sad to say most couples come to that and uh, it doesn't mean anything. And they've already got in the back of their mind, well, if it doesn't work, I can try something else. Without any given thought to what they are saying when they give themselves to God and give themselves to one another. We need to practice this matter of being true one to another. And a strict observance to the promises that we've made one to another. Until death do us part. Until finances do us part. Until fighting in the car does us part. I, uh, whatever it is, but all of the little things that will be thrown at us, but because we've promised to love one another and uh, cherish one another and keep one another and be loyal to one another. I'm reading an interesting book, and I wish I'd have read it uh, how many years ago? Fifty, six years ago, something like that. I wish I'd have read it a long time ago. And uh, you'd think, why are you reading it? I'm not reading it so much for myself now, but for others. And the title of the book is Male Sexuality. Now, you might laugh at that, but I would suggest every man here get it and read it. Men today, for the most part, don't even know where they stand sexually. Let me give an example. And I'm not going to answer this tonight, but I'm just going to throw this out for, out for you. One of the questions that was asked was this. How often does a man think about sex? Somebody said all of the time. You're not far from wrong. <laughs> now watch. Now get serious with me for a moment. Here's a man that doesn't really understand all about it. And he asks himself this question. Am I normal? What's normal? I have these thoughts. I have these feelings. I think about them. But am I normal? And he's afraid to ask his wife. And he's afraid to ask his friend because men don't really talk about those things. Now, women seem to have an eye way of talking about things freely. We men don't. And so we're standing there thinking, what's right? Am I normal? And so then the idea will come back. Here's a beautiful woman who walks down the street and a man looks at her. Now, my daughter's got her own opinion about that, but I've got my opinion about that. And, and he thinks, is that wrong? Is that wrong? I think that woman is beautiful. I think she's dressed nice. Is that wrong for me to think like that? And there's so many things going on in a man's mind today. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what's appropriate. If we do not, here's what will happen. The devil will get a hold of that. Are you listening to me? The devil will get a hold of that and use it. As a matter of fact, some night I may bring a whole message on that just for us men. We'll let you ladies go somewhere else, and we men will get together. But a very good, a very good book on that, and this is st struggles that men face. Now, think with me. Here's a man who goes to an office, and all day long he works with women who are immaculately dressed, and their hair is in place, or they may dress provocatively. And they see that all day long. And they're battling with what, what's right? And am I normal? And all of the rest. And here's what bothers me. A woman will dress very provocatively. But if, a man, accuse, if she, a man looks at her or says something, then she accuses him of harassment, but look at the way she's dressed. Women ought to dress appropriate. The Bible says women ought to dress in modest apparel. Women are excited by touch. Men are excited by sight. And there's got to be the control that is there. But here's this going on and on and on and on in a man's mind. And then women have the same kind of problems. And here's the devil. He's wanting to get into all of that. But here's an answer for you. For all of that, you remain loyal to your partner. You treat her in such a way that she will respond to you in love. And by the way, men... If you will continue to court your wife after marriage, 
And wives, if you will continue to court your husband after marriage, that'll take care of those outside issues. That'll not be an issue. It's much easier for a man to go out into the workplace if his wife has dressed for him and his, if his wife understands his needs and it'll be much better for the wife if the husband continues to romance his wife and love her and when he loves her he's going to be receive back a love and a response from that woman. But the devil wants to get into all of that and tear that to pieces. But just get settled on this matter of uncompromised fidelity. I am going to observe my vows that I made to God. I'm going to observe my vows that I made to one another. Now, what am I talking about? Well, several things. One, I'm talking about love for God. Love for God. If I love God, then I'll want to be right in every area of my life, my home life. And uh, the way I treat my wife, the way I treat my children, the way I, I treat my husband, a love for God. That'll save a, a lot of, uh, of problems for you. Then there's love for our partner. Love for our partner. I, I don't know how many men I've heard say this or women I've heard say this. Uh, I just don't love him anymore. I just don't love her anymore. What do I do? Now, love is an emotion. And it's, it's not this romantic, uh, googly-eyed kind of thing, real love. Real love is commitment to one another, regardless of the circumstances. I got a little, uh, I got a little something to give to you husbands and wives. When you feel like that you don't love your wife or you don't feel like you love your husband, let me give you a little idea. Just act like you do. Just act like you do. And do the things, now listen, do the things that you did when you were courting after you are married and act like you love your wife, act like you love your husband, do the right things, and pretty soon the love will come back. You got it? It'll work. I'll guarantee you it'll work. I like to tell couples about the love bank. You better always be making deposits in your love bank because if you make deposits, one day you'll be able to make a withdrawal. Amen? And you husbands and wives, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Love for God, love for your partner, and then I inserted this, love for a good name. Love for a good name. You know, when you mention Luther, when you mention Wesley, uh, when you mention those kind of names, when you mention Spurgeon, uh, they stand for something. They stand for right, and they stand for uh, good, and they stand for godliness. And that, uh, we've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from that. Uh, a name doesn't mean much these days, but it should. I think we ought to be getting back to the, to the idea of being proud of our homes and being proud of our forefathers and being proud of our heritage. And I think our home says something about us. As a matter of fact, I think everything about our home ought to say something about us. The way people see our home when they come into it. And it may take, and, and, and this, listen, I know it's a hard day. You know what? I, I think some people that's been married for a long time and all of their children are gone, I think they've forgotten how tough it is on young couples today. Here's a young couple that's got four or five kids. And sometimes in the church, we need to be careful. Here's a young couple, they've got four or five kids. Both of them work. And they work all week long. And they come home and take care of the house. And they take care of those kids. And then they're expected to be at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Then we expect them to do all the other things. And sometimes we who are married, our children are up and they're gone, who we have a little bit more time, we forget how much energy it takes to raise two or three little kids in the house and take care of them. Are you listening to me? And it might take a lot of work on the husband and wife's part to keep that house clean and looking good because that house says something about you. Let me say this. A home is a reflection on the husband and the wife, but keeping it clean is a reflection on the wife. And gals, I hate it that it's that way, but that's the way it is. You go into a woman's house and the way it looks is a reflection on her. And my mother used to say that all of the time. We've got a stupid tree out in front 
that the leaves start to die in July. Really, I mean, in July, those leaves start to die, and here they come. And uh, I got to the house the other day, I think it was Thursday, and here are all them leaves all over my yard, and they're over my neighbor's yard. And I said, I can't have that. And so I got out there and got to work and got all those leaves up, and in an hour they were back down again. So I said, okay, I'm going to get me a saw and a climb up in this tree, and you leaves are gone. And so I got the ladder, and I went up the cutting limbs off that tree. And by the time I get done, ain't going to be no leaves on that tree. Because I don't want my neighbors to drive by and say, there's a preacher who lives there, and look at that filthy yard. Now you laugh at that, but that yard and that home says something about me. Your home, inside and out, says something about you, says something about your name. I believe that we ought to be the best we can for the glory of God, don't you? Um, I've gotten a, sort of away from wearing a suit every day to the office. I used to wear a suit to the office every day. That sure got old. But anyway, I got down here in South Carolina, and it's hot down here in South Carolina. And in the summertime, it's real hot down here. And so I try to wear a nice dress shirt and whatever uh, through the week except on Wednesdays or when I'm having counseling sessions and so forth. But one day a week, if I could just dress down one day a week, it helps me. I wish that there'd be just one day a week I didn't have to shave. And I wish I could just sort of dress down. And I try to, and there's nothing wrong with that, but still yet, uh, we ought to try to be the best we can be for the glory of God. And there ought to be leisure time and all of that. But I'm just talking about a name. Uncompromised fidelity if the home is going to stay strong. Number two, there must be an unwavering faith. An unwavering faith. There's got to be faith in God. Faith in God. And faith is imparted by God. God is the one that gives the faith. Listen, every day ask God to give you faith. And I, and I ask the church to pray, Lord, may Gospel Light Baptist Church increase in love, in faith, and in holiness. Pray that prayer for yourself. And pray that prayer for your home. Ask God to impart to your family faith in God. That'll help you uh, when you're having trouble with bills. And that'll help you when you're having a problem tithing like you ought to and giving the missions the way that you ought to. Now, I, I'm a firm believer in tithing and I'm a firm believer in giving to missions, faith promise missions. I'm a firm believer in that. I back down on that not at all. I'll not remove from that at all. I believe that's in the Bible. I believe that it's taught there. And uh, I think we ought to give and, uh, to, to missions and I think we ought to give uh, our tithe uh, to, to the Lord. Uh, sometimes I think we can go overboard and ask people to give too much, and we've got so many things to give for. But I'm a stickler on the matter of tithing and on the matter of missions, but that takes faith to do that. That takes faith. You've just got to believe God will keep His promises. That if you give Him 10%, He'll help you to live on the 90%. And then you give above that, and God just has a way of doing things. God has miraculously taken care. I, I believe with all of my heart of my wife and my family, and this church has been so good to me and to my wife. Some of the men here know to keep me away from a car, except drive it. They love my wife enough that they don't want me working on my car. The other day, Sue had been running around doing all kinds of things, and she pulled up in front of the yard, and as soon as she got in front of the yard, the car was hot. The water pump had went out. Now, don't you think God was good in letting the water pump go out when she drove up in the driveway rather than downtown? Now, you say that's, that's insignificant. I don't think it is. It's happened too many times that God just takes care of his people. And uh, so uh, uh, Spooner Boy is not here. And uh, so Brother Steve uh, Thomas, he came, put the water pump on, and charged me an astronomical price i got to take him out to lunch Wednesday. I, I, I don't mind taking out to lunch, but being with him. I, but anyway, uh, God will take care of you, amen, and take care of your needs and watch over you.
Faith is imparted by God. It is strengthened by the Word of God. If you've got weak faith, it's probably because you're not spending much time right here in the book. You see, you read what the Bible says, you apply it to your life, you, you live it out, and it develops faith and builds a strong faith in your life. And then faith should be revealed to our children. Our faith ought to be revealed to our children. Put down the third and last thing. It might be the most important thing I can say tonight concerning this matter of essentials to a strong home. Urgent forgiveness. Urgent forgiveness. It bothers me when people won't forgive. And the devil can use that. The devil can use that in a church. Well, I forgive you, but I won't forget. You know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is not holding on. That's what it is. Forgiveness is not holding on. What if Jesus would have said, I won't forgive you? What if he had said, my forgiveness, my love is conditional? Wouldn't that have been an awful thing? But he's forgiven us, and we ought to forgive one another. Now, in the home, the devil will work on this matter. Husband, wife, who won't forgive, who hold things in, who harbor and who look for revenge and all of the rest of that. The devil loves to do that. Now, there are several things we need to practice this matter of forgiveness. For instance, a lack of consideration. Sometimes we're just not as considerate to one another as we ought to be. It's a busy world. And there are so many things that are going on. There are so many things that are happening. I try to the very best that I can not to bring church problems home. And especially to my wife. Now, if I need her advice, I'll ask it. But I try not to do that. I don't want to unload uh, on other folk. And I believe the Bible says we ought to bear our own burdens. And I try to do that. But you know, sometimes things can get so difficult and you're thinking about your problems and you're thinking about your ministry and you're thinking about your work and because of that you are not quite as considerate to your partner as you ought to be. And there ought to be forgiveness to one another for that and move on. Maybe it's a lack of control. And some of us fellows, we've got to work on that, anger. And being out of control. And by the way, the devil knows how to push the right buttons at the right time, doesn't he? There is not a weak note goes by because the devil knows I've got a problem with driving. Oh, I was coming, I was visiting over in, uh, on the other side of Otranto, on the other side of the uh, railroad tracks over there. You know what bothers me about down there at the 76 station? You know what bothers me when you come out of there? you got three lanes of traffic, right, going one way. You've got a turning lane here. Then you've got a lane that goes straight. And then you've got a turning lane that goes left. You know what happens every time I go down there and I want to go straight? There's a line of traffic and somebody has blocked the middle lane. You can turn to the right, you can turn to the left, but there's park right in the middle of the lane. The other day I was just as happy as could be. Man, I was just singing and whistling and thinking about how wonderful everything is. And I come across the railroad track, and there that lady, everything's clear. The whole line is clear. But that lady, looked like Dawn, was parked right in that one lane. Now, you know what the devil wanted me to do? Get out and beat the snot out of her. You wouldn't admit that because you've got, you're under control. That never bothers you. But me, the devil knows that. And so I have to pray every morning, Lord, help me to be under control. And I have to put the full armor of God on every day. I don't know about you. You may not need it, but I do. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because he's after you as a person and after your family, after your home, after this church. Forgiveness when it comes to the matter of a lack of control. A lack of companionship. A lack of... Uh, of love, a lack of communication, on and on we can go. But the matter of forgiveness, and I believe these are essentials to a strong home, a strong Christian home. Stand with me in prayer, if you will. Has God spoke to your heart tonight about some area of your life? Has He spoken to you tonight about some area in your home that needs attention? And you've not given attention to it, but God has spoken to your heart tonight about it. You need to come uh, to the altar and get on your knees and talk to God about it.
I'm going to invite you to come tonight. Brother Clint, if you'll come and help me again this evening. If anyone needs prayer tonight, uh, Brother Clint will be here and I'll be here to help you. Uh, but whatever you need tonight to talk to God, to give uh, Him your thoughts, whatever it is. In a moment we'll sing 816, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. And our altar is ready here and uh, waiting for you, waiting for us.